the real God versus the religious God. And the Holy Ghost said this to me. He said, uh, in some ways, uh, well, he made it a little more plainer. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tone it down a little bit. Uh, well, I don't know. I should just say, he's like, I, I can't see my reflection in the church today. I can't see my reflection in the church today. The modern, not everybody. I think he's just talking the church as a whole, especially in our nation. You can't see the church. We're supposed to be a reflection of him. And he's supposed to, we're supposed to reflect him to the world. Amen. Well, we're, you and I are working. We're going we're gonna to change that, right? We can't, we can't control everybody, but we can control our lives, right? So I'm purposed. Are you purposed to be a reflection of who Jesus is, of who our Father is? Everybody, he's good, right? And so our, we ought to reflect him to the world. And so we've been talking about um, a relig- uh, 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 the real God. And you can find the real God in the Old Covenant, and you can find the real God in the Gospels, and you can find the real God in the Epistles, and you can find that the real God, if you're born again, lives on the inside of you. And then there's a religious God. What is a religious God? Well, religion is just, you know, the Bible says the traditions of men make the word of God of no effect. So a religion is just a tradition. It's, it's something made up. It's not something God asks us to be or do. And religion is also works-oriented. It's based on what I can do that then I expect God to do something. But that's just not how this is. And so um, are you grateful to understand the Word of God and understand some things about God? I, I'm just excited about this. I don't know how much longer we're going to do this. This is number six, and it feels like we're just getting started. Uh, but it, uh, I don't normally do this, but I want to give you I have two main scriptures. So 1 Corinthians chapter 2. The one thing when I do this, I tend to preach off them a little bit. we got to get going today. So believe God with me that we'll get where we want to go because i got some things in my heart to do. Uh, I don't usually do on uh, Sunday morning services, but it's in my heart to do. So let's get to them. So 1 Corinthians um, chapter 2 verses 4 and 5, King James says, And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration. The real God always demonstrates. It says... The, so the preaching of the word of God ought to have a demonstration with it. If there's no demonstration, is it the believed gospel? It can even be the gospel but not believed. So you can say something and not believe it and there's no demonstration. But you can preach something and believe it and then there should be a demonstration. God is a demonstrator. Church was never meant to be um, just a sit and learn. Uh, there should be demonstration if the word of God is preached. There ought to be a demonstration when you speak the word of God. See, that, see, if there's not, then that's religious. Y'all don't shout me down. That's just religious. I'm not up for religion. I fought 30 years against it, and I'm not going to yield to it today. Hallelujah. It was with, a, everybody say, demonstration. A demonstration of what? A demonstration of the Spirit or the Holy Spirit and of what? So, so when the Word of God is preached, what, what should happen? There should always be a now I'm not now listen to me. In our church, everybody got to understand this. I'm not talking about running around the room. I'm not necessarily talking about swing. We don't have any chandeliers, but swinging from the chandeliers and rolling around or laughing. That's not always the demonstration. That can be a demonstration, and it's all right. But it's not the ultimate demonstration. What's the demonstration? Well, the demonstration of God's spirit and his power. What does his power do? It changes people. It heals the sick. It delivers people. It sets people free. Hallelujah. So what are we looking for? I'm looking for a demonstration. God's looking to demonstrate. And what? In his spirit and power. Everybody say power. What? That's your faith. Now, people don't understand. I thought my faith was supposed to rest in the word of God. But anytime the word of God is preached, anytime the word of God is taught, there ought to be a demonstration. And what? So that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Right? That your faith would not stand in the way. Even if someone takes the word and it's coming from their brain, if it's just wisdom, it's just words, your faith can't stand in it. It has to be anointed. It has to be from God. It has to be believed. That your faith would not stand in the wisdom of men, but what's your faith supposed to rest in? The power of God. Why? Because God always demonstrates his word. He is not a man that he should lie. Has he not said it? Will he not also do it? What did Elizabeth prophesy to Mary? There shall be a performance of the word that was spoken to you. God is a demonstrator. Say it. God is. Say my God is. The real God is a demonstrator. 
And that's the truth. Hallelujah. 1 Thessalonians 1, 5 through 6, for our gospel. 1 Thessalonians 1, 5, for our gospel came not unto you in word only. So if it's word only, it's probably not the gospel. If it's word only or it's just evokes emotion. You see, emotion comes after the presence of God comes. But if it's just emotion and no power, it's probably not the gospel. You Listen, I've done this long enough. I can, I can work you up. Preachers know how to work people up. You can, work, uh, you can go to a political rally and get worked up. I'm not talking about getting worked up. I'm talking about understanding when the gospel comes, it's not in word only. And, and so it's not emotion. But when the word comes, the power comes, and then the emotion comes. People have got it out. Well, I'm going to just get all worked up so God will come. Well, he doesn't come for emotion. He comes for words. And when he comes, our gospel came not to you in word only. That's why I'm trying really hard today not to give you my opinion. The pulpits of America are full of opinion and not the word of God. And God cannot demonstrate opinion. He can only demonstrate his word. Even if their opinion might be correct in line with the word, he still can't demonstrate after it. He only demonstrates his word, Mark 16, 20. And they went forth everywhere. And the Lord, the Lord worked with them. God needs somebody to work with. Can he work with you? Can he work with you? Can he work with the words coming out your mouth? Can he work with what you believe? Can he work with what you believe? Can he work with what you're saying? Can he work with what I'm preaching? See, that's what we want. Our, the gospel came not only in word only, but in power. There's that word power is again. Everybody shout power. And in the Holy Ghost. And much assurance that we, you know what manner men we were for your sake. All right. So today we're going to talk about a word that I like to talk about. We're going to talk about the anointing. The real God has always anointed men and women. The real God demonstrates himself through the anointing. You see the anointing in the old covenant. You see the anointing on Jesus in the gospels. And you see the anointing on the church, on the believer. And so we're going to talk about it today. And we're going to work up to the place where we talk about what the anointing does. The anointing must be, just like everything I'm trying to talk to you about, is this is who the real God is. The real God answers by fire. The God who's God, let him answer by fire. He answered by fire on the day of Pentecost. He's still answering by fire today. Jesus is the baptizer of the Holy Ghost and fire. You don't, you know, tongues is an evidence, but you, what you ought to got was fire. What you ought to got was fire. Tongues is just the evidence. The real God still answers prayer. Now, I told you I agree with the world. They get mad and say, don't, don't, don't send me any more prayers. Well, you were never supposed to send anyone any prayers. Prayers do not go this way. Prayers go this way. And I know this, if somebody understood prayer, they would want me to pray for them. Because this is the confidence that I have. That if I ask anything according to the will of God, I know that he hears me. Well, that sounds arrogant. No, that's just the word. That's just the word. Amen. Amen. And when we gather together in unity and pray like they did in the book of Acts, I mean, lives were changed. Peter was glad for John Mark's mama, who had a prayer meeting, prayed him out of prison. You ought to come to On the Wall tonight and maybe pray some people out of prison. The spiritual one, maybe even the natural one, I don't know. The God who answers by, he, he, he answers by fire, he answers prayer. He's a, the real God is a covenant-keeping God. Amen? Hallelujah. He's good. Amen? I said the real God is good. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. The real God. Wow. His presence has always been a manifestation. It's not new in the new covenant. His, pres his presence is all since he walked with Adam and Eve. And then in the old covenant, even with them... He, uh, you know, the children of Israel and Egypt. I mean, when he got him out, then he manifested himself in a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And he, all throughout the book of Acts, you see his presence. And so all these things I'm talking to you about are the real God. So anyone that doesn't want the power of God, anyone that doesn't want to see the fire of God, 
Anyone that doesn't believe in that God always answers prayer, they're serving a religious God, somebody they have made up. Might as well serve Dagon. That didn't come up from up here. I, I want to take that one back, but I, I can't. It's already out there. I'm not saying they're not going to heaven. If you get born again, you're going to heaven. But come on, y'all. He's real. And he's waiting on his body to show his reality. Well, Pastor Mark, we all believe that. I know, but he wants to make you stronger. He needs you to become an influencer. <laughs> you beca- <laughs> no, never mind. I don't know how you're going to do it. You can become a Jesus TikTok star. Is that what that is, tic-tac-toe? I don't, I don't know what that is. <laughs> Whatever that is, whatever they do. I don't know. I heard something like it. I heard something like it. I don't know. I've never seen it. You can become a Facebook celebrity. I don't know. But let's stand up for Jesus. Let's stand up for the power of God. Amen. i got to hurry up. All right. So um, I want to talk to you about, everybody say anointing. Now, so a lot of times when people think of anointing, they always start with this, and it's true. It means to smear on. But if you just stop with it means to smear on, you're not going to really get what God has about this. It's a spiritual word. People always go, well, naturally it just means to smear on. But it's more than smear on. It's smear on God's presence. But it's more than that. And so in the Old Covenant, I'm just going to go through these really quick. Uh, God anointed three people in the Old Covenant. He anointed the priest, the king, and the prophet. And then there were sometimes the anointed people for a special purpose. So in the Old Covenant, the, the anointing was not for everybody, but it was something real and it was tangible. So in Exodus chapter 40, verses 13 through 15, Exodus chapter 40, verses 13 through 15. And when I give it, just put it up there. And you shall put on air in the holy garments, and thou shalt put upon air in the holy garments and anoint him and sanctify him that he may minister to me. So the Lord said, anoint him. So there was the human part that God asked them to anoint them to to set them in the office, verse 14. And you bring his sons and clothe them with coats, verse 15. It says, and you shall anoint them and, and uh, as you did to their father, that they may minister to me. So they were anointed to minister to him. For their anointing shall sure be an everlasting priest. So now it, it goes from, it's a, I want you to anoint them. And then it goes, then it starts talking about their anointing. It becomes from a natural thing where a man anointed them to put them in place. And now it says, and their anointing shall be an everlasting priesthood throughout the generations. And now they're anointed by God to minister to him. So it's not just a natural thing. Something spiritual also went along. Even in the old covenant, something spiritual always went along with the natural side of things. We in the church, let's not be mere men. Let's not be carnal Christians. Let's understand the realm of the spirit and what's really going on. So that's the priest office. I could talk a lot about it, but I'm not going to. Number two is the king. The king, remember the children of Israel wanted to be like everybody else, said, give me a king. They had God, but they wanted, they wanted somebody they could see. They wanted to be like everybody else. They wanted to be like the world. And so God led them. And he loved them so much, he said, well, let me help you out. Y'all don't know what you're asking for, but I'm going to help you out. And so the first one we see was Saul. Remember Samuel, the prophet, went to anoint Saul to be king. First Samuel chapter 10, verse number 1. It says, and Samuel took a vial of oil, so this is Samuel, the prophet's side, and he poured it upon his head and kissed him. I'm sure that was on the forehead. And said, it is not because, it is not because the Lord hath anointed thee to be, has, it is not because the Lord has anointed thee to be captain over his inheritance. So the Lord anointed him to be captain. And then I want you to see then that natural thing happened, but then something spiritual happened. I want you to see, even in the old covenant, there was a natural anointing, a smearing on of the oil, which always represents the Holy Ghost and God's power. The, the anointing represents, always has, always will, represents the Spirit of God and God's power. It's not dead. It's not a ritual. Even in the Old Covenant, when they were anointed with oil, something spiritual preceded. I mean, not preceded, it happened after. Preceded is before. It happened after. Y'all with me? Y'all with me? How do everybody say anointing? Okay, now let's see what happened to him in verse number 6. In verse number 6, it says, And the Spirit of the Lord will come on you. This is, this is Saul the king 
who they all wanted and God anointed. And, and he was even going to mess up not many verses later. But God did it anyway. Because God's power is so important, the Spirit of the Lord will come on you and you'll prophesy. And that anointing will do what? It'll turn you into another man. Even in the old covenant, the anointing will have the ability to turn someone into another man. Even in the old covenant, the anointing, the reality of the power of God, the smeared on presence of God, the oil of the Holy Ghost, the reality of the truth, the spirit of life, it come on somebody, even in the old covenant, even on servants, turned them into another man. And then y'all remember David, well, we like David, don't we? First Samuel, verse 16, what do we know about David? He's a man after God's own heart. So remember Saul fell. How you know? How you know? Even when Saul fell, God had somebody else. He's trying to help him. He had, he had somebody else. God's trying to help him. Samuel took the horn of oil, anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And this, what happened? He anointed him and what happened? I, I want you to see this. this is what the Holy Ghost point. Tell him it's more than natural. The anointing is not natural. It never has been, never will be. Never has been. In the old covenant, you think, well, you know, it's just a procedural thing. It's never, they had to do something in the natural. I don't have doctrine for this, but I'm telling you, it's almost like they had to do something in the natural, especially in the old, so that God could do something to make it a legal thing. They did something in the natural, and then when they did it in the natural, you see the Spirit of God come. When Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him. Can you see this? In the midst of his brethren. Then what happened? The Spirit of the Lord came on him. What, what, was, what does the anointing do? It empowered him to do something. What does the anointing do? It's the smeared on presence of God. It's a reality. It's the power of God. That power enables you. It turns Saul into another man. He could have been the greatest king ever, but, but he got out of his place. But that anointing turned him into somebody else. It's the power of God. It's real. It was real in the old covenant. It's re- it was real when Jesus was ministering on the earth, and it's real for you. What did you do for him? And the Spirit of the Lord came upon him from that day forward. What did the Spirit of God come upon him to do? It came upon him from that day forward to be the king. He didn't immediately take his kingship, but the anointing was there for him to do it. Now, a lot of people leave this out. Anybody want to go to the next chapter? Anybody ever heard of Goliath? How many know, David's, how many know David is a giant slayer? And he did that just because God liked him. No, he did that because he was anointed to be king. Because the current king was dealing with the devil. Remember even how the Lord used David to, as, a, as a psalmist, as he played and sang, the devil would leave Saul. Right? But now there's this Goliath. Y'all remember? Have you ever had any Goliaths in your life? Now, the good thing is, Jesus already took care of them all. And really, that's how David came at Goliath. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that defies the armies of the living God? Well, why does he say that? Because he understands something about the anointing now. Because while he was standing there, even though his daddy didn't want him to come in, didn't think he was worthy to come in, and his brothers are like, you know, they don't even like him. Who are you? What are you up here for? Go back to your little sheep who's watching your few sheep. But suddenly, this is, this is what happened. It doesn't say it like this, but this is what I know. He was anointed to be king from that day forward. He runs into Goliath. And suddenly, now God is able to use him because he's anointed. He's anointed to do what? What does a king do? Remember later when David got in trouble with Bathsheba. Y'all remember her? The Bible starts out with when kings were at war. David's anointing was to rule and to reign and bring victory to the children of Israel, but he decided to stay home that year. And when he wasn't walking in his anointing, he wasn't walking in the power of God, he yielded to his flesh. And the same thing will happen with you and I. But you say, well, I'm not anointed, you're anointed. No, I'm going to get you there. We're all anointed. And if you don't walk in your anointing, your flesh will win too. Because this was never meant to be natural. This was never, you weren't even meant to be natural to put down your flesh. If you'll walk in the spirit, if you'll walk in your anointing, if you'll walk in the power of God, you won't fulfill the lust of your flesh. King David, the reason that he got rid of Goliath was because he was anointed to be the king. And that's what the anointing on the king does. 
And when he didn't participate in the anointing, his flesh ruled out. Now, aren't you glad God's full of mercy and kindness? Even in the old covenant, because David was a man after his own heart. Praise God. Because David repented. That's a good Bible word. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I mean, it's even said about David. We'll just go real quick. Um, 2 Samuel 23, 1, just so you know how God viewed him. Now, these are the last words of David. David, the son of Jesse, said, and the man who was raised up on high, the anointed of God. David was known as the anointed of God and the sweet psalmist of Israel. What was David known for? As the anointing. Oh, to God, we'd be known for the anointing. What is it? The reality of the presence of God. Hallelujah. 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 Psalms 89 20. Got to hurry. Psalms 89 20. I have found David, my servant. He's a what? Servant. And I, and with, I, I have found David, my servant. With my holy oil have I anointed him. David, it was a manifest presence of God under an old covenant king, but God did that. He, he, he anointed the, the priest, the prophet, the king, and then, uh, you know, we, prophets. Man, there's so many. There's Samuel, there's Nathan, but most of the prophets we know, we know Elijah and Elisha the best, so I just thought we'd just look at them under just a little bit. First King chapters 19 and 16. So uh, remember, Elijah is done getting ready to go home. Remember, he's, he was under the tree, and, you know, the Lord had to talk to him. But he said, now you go do this. Go anoint Jehu, the son of Nishmi, shall thou anoint to be king over Israel. Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of, uh, yeah, you're going to anoint to be prophet in your room. I mean, he's going to take your place. So just real quick there. So, uh, so that was something they did. But um, let's look at this, 2 Kings chapter 2. 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 9 through 15. Everybody stay with me. So we got Elijah. He's anointed to be prophet. Now he's getting ready to leave, and the Lord gave him an assignment. Go anoint two kings. Go anoint. Why, why do the kings need to be anointed? Because they need to, the ability to function in their role. And then he said, go anoint Elisha, because without the, the anointing, you know, that, so there was a natural side, but also then there was a spiritual side. Now here, we're going to see the spiritual side. You mostly know this, but I want to show you. And it came to pass when they were gone over, the Elijah said to Elisha, ask what I shall do for you. Remember, this is where Elijah went, was going to all those four places. And at first he said, you just stay here, Elisha. And, Elijah, and Elisha said, as the Lord God lives. You ain't getting out of my sight. I have served you too long, and I, I got a request. And I'm going to hang with you because he knows. Remember, Elisha knew what was coming because everywhere they went, the prophets were saying, do you know that Elijah's going to get caught up? Everybody knew about it, but everybody didn't partake of what Elisha could partake of because the Lord anointed Elisha because there was lots of prophets, but the Lord anointed one to take Elijah's place. And he said, before I be taken away from thee, and Elisha said, I pray you give me a double portion. Well, that tells me the anointing can either be increased or decreased on people. And sometimes that is more up to you than it is up to God. In this case, it was up to God, but it was a request. He said, I, I want double. This is my assumption. Maybe this is an opinion. I don't know if that Elijah was easy to serve because he seems to be up. Well, just go ahead and kill me. I'm the only one. And down. That's hard to... Anyway. I think Elisha said, I've served you. I see the anointing. I had that with people that I've served. In the natural, I wanted to get them in a headlock. But when I, when I served them in the spirit, man. And, I, and, I, and there's some things that linger on my life from people that I served. The anointing that's on people can also be caught. All right. And so here, so he said, uh, uh, Elisha said, I pray thee a double portion. Verse 10. He's like, uh, ooh, you ask a hard thing. But if you see me, okie dokie. Verse 11. And it came to pass uh, that there appeared a chariot of fire, horses of fire, uh, the part of center. And Elijah went up in a whirlwind to heaven. 12. And Elisha saw it. And that what he said, you got to do, you got to see it. And he said, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel, the horsemen thereafter. And he saw him no more. And he took hold of his own clothes and he, and he and rent them in pieces. In other words, what he had on, he took off. Verse 13. And he took up the mantle. 
Now, you know, mantle, uh, mantles. What about mantles? Well, Elisha had something that probably signified it was a piece of his clothing, but it may have signified about his office. He took up the mantle, uh, the, and, and it spiritually means the presence of God that, that, that fell from him, and he went back and stood by the bank of the Jordan, verse 14. And he took the mantle, and he took the anointing, and he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and smote the waters. That's how they got there, because Elijah did it. Now Elisha's doing the same thing. He said, where is the Lord God of Elijah? Well, I'm telling you, we still have the same Lord God that David had. We have the same Lord God that Elijah had. We have the same Lord God that Elisha had. We have the same Lord God that Adam had. We have the same Lord God, obviously, that Jesus had. Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when they had smitten the waters, they parted hither and thither, and Elisha went over. Verse 15, look at this. And when the sons of the prophets, which were to view at Jericho, saw him, they said, The spirit of Elijah does rest on Elisha. And they came to meet him and bowed themselves to the ground before him. So the anointing is also obvious. The anointing is also obvious. The power of God is obvious. God is... He's not hiding in a room. He'd like to be obvious. I'm God. This is what I do. But you know, he's always chosen to do it through people. I don't have time, but Samson. Samson had a special anointing. You remember his mama couldn't have babies? And then, you know, she, she, she was a mess and she got pregnant. And then the, an angel came to her at, at first and then her and her husband. Say, so, okay, there's going to be a son in you, and uh, you can't, you know, no strong drink, uh, nothing, no wine, um, and don't cut his hair. He's going to be a Nazarite, for, you know, from birth. And, um, and the Lord wanted to use him. And so you all know the account, though, uh, that Samson did feats of strength. Now, that's a special anointing. Now, any of you uh, who are saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost, I'm not telling you you're going to be able to deadlift 600 pounds. But in this case, the Spirit of God came on him, and he became better than any superhero. Right? And the Lord used him to, uh, to whoop up on the Philistines, which are always a type of this world. So it was a special anointing. Special anointing. What? You could see it. It was obvious. Was Samson perfect? Whew, not even close. But that's the, the anointing was on him. How I many you know Jesus was anointed? Yeah. Right? So Luke chapter 3, verses 21 and 22. John the Baptist is water baptizing. And Jesus came and it's like, okay, it's my turn. Remember him and John had a light? I ain't doing that. You know what I mean? But then what happened? Now when the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus was also baptized and, and praying. And the heaven was open. And the Holy Ghost, who? The Holy Ghost. Do you know a Holy Ghost? Have you received the Holy Ghost? Does he live in you? Is he on you? Is he the same Holy Ghost? We don't have a twin. We don't have a lesser. Same Holy Ghost. Everybody say Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost descended in bodily shape like a dove upon him. The Holy Ghost is not a dove. He's not a cute white bird. It just said he descended in bodily shape like a dove. How a dove would come upon. And a voice came from heaven. Wow. This is my beloved son. In him I am well pleased. And then what happened? From that moment, the anointing came on him. How do we know? Well, after that, the Spirit of God told him to go into the wilderness. Right? And then Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and 19. Then after Jesus came back from the wilderness where the devil tempted him, the anointing on his life got stronger. The power got longer, stronger. And what did he say? The Spirit of the Lord's upon me. The Spirit of the Lord's upon me. Why? Because he found it. Flip back to Isaiah 61.1. Isaiah 61.1. Jesus found where it was written about him. Have you ever found where it's written about you? Hallelujah. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Because he, he found it written in the Word of God. If anyone ever tells you don't study the Old Covenant, that would be like someone saying, Jesus, you ought not quote the Old Covenant. That would be like, uh, Apostle Paul, you shouldn't have referenced the Old Covenant. You need, I, I heard one time this guy, uh, uh, somebody gave somebody in a foreign country the New Testament. 
And, and said, here, read this. You know, they got born again, filled with the Holy Ghost. Here, here's the New Testament. And that person got a hold of them and said, where's the rest of the book? Even in reading it, he knew there was the rest of the book. We don't get our doctrine from the old covenant. We have a new and better covenant. But you're supposed to learn the examples of it, and you're supposed to learn that God is God. And if he did it for them, he's the same God, but we have a new and better covenant. Jesus took the place so God doesn't have to pour out his penalty anymore on anybody. But the truth of the matter is he's still the same God. And the, the same things that he liked then, he still likes now. The things that he hated back then, he still hates now. Hallelujah, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord's anointed me to preach good things unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and to the opening of the prison to them that are bound. And so we see that in Luke. Jesus recites that. Why? Because he's anointed. He said, the Spirit of the Lord right now is upon me. The Spirit of God is upon me. Now, don't you get scared to say the Spirit of the Lord's upon me. Because the Holy Ghost is in you and the Holy Ghost is on you. Let's look at it again. Luke chapter 4, verses 18 to 19. Jesus said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Everybody say, the Spirit of the Lord is on me. Why? Because you're anointed. He anointed Jesus. Jesus didn't do anything on his own up until he was 30. I don't care what movie you watch. He wasn't healing no bird's wings. He wasn't married. The Bible is the only accurate account. The true Bible is the only accurate account of who Jesus is. And he didn't do any miracles before the age of 30. He just didn't. Why? He needed the Holy Ghost to come on him. What does the church need? Well, they need the Holy Ghost to come on him. God can't demonstrate unless the Holy Ghost, who is the demonstrator, demonstrates. And so some people today, well, I, I think we ought to tone it down. Well, I believe the Lord wants to turn it up. Well, I think we ought to do things different on Sunday morning. I beg to differ. I believe we ought to do what the Bible does, what the Bible says. The church of, i got to get going. Hallelujah. Luke 4, 18, 19. The Spirit of the Lord's upon me. Everybody say it again. The Spirit of the Lord's upon me. Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and 19. It says, the Spirit of the Lord is on me to preach the gospel to the poor, sent me to heal the brokenhearted. What's the anointing going to do? What's it going to do? It's going to cause you to preach. Well, I'm not a preacher. Sure you are. You're a minister of reconciliation. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Do you know any brokenhearted people? Well, the Spirit of God will heal him. Hallelujah. He sent me to preach deliverance to the captives. Do you know anybody captive? Wow. You and I know a lot of a recovering of sight to the blind. That's not physical blindness. That's spiritual blindness. To set them liberty that are bruised. What? To preach the acceptable year of the Lord. What is that? Jubilee. What is that? Restoration, restoration, restoration. Rest, the anointing restores. The anointing restores. The anointing restores. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's look at 2 Corinthians. Chapter 1, verse 20. Let's talk about us. You ready to talk about you? 2 Corinthians, chapter 1. 2 Corinthians, chapter 1, verse 20. For all the promise of God, 1 Corinthians, not 2. I was wrong. You were, you were right. I was wrong. 1 Corinthians. Is it 2 Corinthians? Okay, I was right. Oh, I was, I was going to run into it. For all the promises of God are yes and amen to those who are... I was wrong. You're right. <laughs> Second Corinthians 1. I got a Bible here. I'll just read it. Second Corinthians 1. 20. For all the promises of God in him are what? Amen. And unto the glory of God. Unto what? The glory of God. Unto the glory of God. What? By us. What? How can that be? Now he which establishes us with you... In Christ. Do we got anybody in Christ? Amen. What is Christ? What's Jesus' last name, Pastor? It absolutely is not. Come on. He's better than, than anybody you know, any celebrity with a one name only. It's, Christ is not his last name. It's a description. What is the description of? It's, it's the anointing. Jesus Christ, the anointed one. You're anointed. Because you're in Christ. In, in, you're in the anointing. You're in the anointing. Now, he which established us with you is in, in Christ, in the anointing, and has, what? No. 
he has done what with you? So you can boldly say, I'm anointed. So you better right now say, I'm anointed. What is the anointing? I showed you quickly, but I showed you in the Old Covenant what it does. There was a natural side, but there's always a spiritual side. The anointing always did something. The anointing caused the prophet to say something. The anointing caused the king to uh, destroy an adversary, to rule. The anointing causes the priest to be able to minister to God. A special anointing caused strength to come forward to uh, annihilate an enemy. Right? And then Jesus, was he anointed? Well, we can all agree on that, right? Anybody remember Acts 10, 38? How the Lord, it didn't say how Jesus anointed Jesus. It's how the Lord, how the, really, the Holy Ghost, God, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the, so the Holy Ghost is the anointing. So the Holy Ghost is the manifest presence of God. Do you have the Holy Ghost? Do you have the Holy Ghost? Well, you and I have him twofold. I know today in the modern church, well, I got as much Holy Ghost as you got. Well, I agree, the Holy Ghost comes in us, and that's a well of salvation. But how many know we looked at the, another time that Jesus said believers ought to speak in other tongues? And the way you're only going to speak in other tongues if you get baptized in the Holy Ghost. Baptized is, uh, is, is full immersion. And Jesus is the agent that immerses you in the Holy Ghost in power. But so you and I as a believer, you know, I'm getting tired of talk, people, you know, well, I just believe tongues is an option. Jesus didn't think so. Uh, it's not salvation, and I can prove that to you by the word of God. So it's not salvation, but it wasn't an option for him. He didn't say, well, this is for you if you want to. He said, no, this is necessary. It was so necessary, the start of the church. He said, you wait, don't go anywhere until this happens. And then today, as the church, we're trying to be weak and wimpy and do it in our own strength and our own power when we have the answer. And the answer is that Jesus is the baptizer of the Holy Ghost and fire and the power and the anointing. God needs his anointed church. And it's not just preachers, it's you. Say, I'm anointed. What says so? The Bible. He has anointed you, 1 John 2 and 20 and 27. And in the same way, the anointing does different things. Number one, it gives you power. Power to do what? Well, number one, to be a witness. There's power available with the Holy Ghost. But you have an unction from the Holy One. You know all things. That unction is anointing. It's the same thing. Verse 27. It says, but the anointing which you have received from him abides in you, and you don't need anybody to teach you. That anointing teaches you. Just like the anointing in the Old Covenant taught a king how to rule and reign, that anointing on the inside of you will teach you some things. And then part of it is ruling and reigning on the earth. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Well, Psalms 23.5. Let's skip ahead because I am going to do what's on my heart. Psalms 23.5. So Psalms 23.5, you know about the Psalms 23. It's the psalm, you know, it's not a funeral psalm. It's a living psalm. But it's okay if they use it at a funeral. But Psalms 23, 5 says, You prepare a table before me in the... Well, is the enemy around? Okay, we qualify. You prepare a table for me in the presence of enemies. What happens? What do you need at the table? You need some anointing. He anoints my head with oil. A little cross on the forehead. No? It says, you anoint my head with oil and my cup runs. You're supposed to be overflowing with the anointing. And then life comes along, and then, but Psalms 92 and 10 is good. Life comes along and tries to drain us of the anointing. Psalms 92 and 10 comes along. It says, my horn shall thou exalt like the horn of a unicorn. I shall be anointed with fresh oil. When's the last oil change you had? You know, you don't change your oil in your car, you're going to lock up your engine. If this is a believer, you don't change the oil, get some new stuff from the heaven, you're going to lock up your engine. Hallelujah. Isaiah 10, 27. We're going to do this right now. Isaiah 10, 27. So the ushers to get ready. Isaiah 10, 27, not going to take a long time. 
And it shall come to pass in that day that his burden shall be taken away from off thy shoulder and his yoke from off your neck. And the yoke, what is the yoke? It's a burden. And this is on my heart. And the yoke shall be destroyed. Destroyed. What destroys it? The anointing. Now, this is an old covenant. Isaiah the prophet speaking forward. But if the anointing can turn Saul, who wasn't that good of a guy, into another man. If the anointing can come on David and cause a little teenage boy to destroy a giant. If an anointing could come upon a, a priest, and we found out, even the priests I were talking about, some of them weren't all that good either. But they could stand in the presence of God for the people and minister to the Lord. If the presence of God could come on Samson, and he didn't do everything right, and God used him to deliver the people from the Philistines, the last act he did was the greatest act he did, even after he'd messed up the biggest. Am I advocating messing up? No, but just quit thinking about why I've got to become some super Christian in order to walk in the anointing. Jesus is the super Christian. <laughs> you just receive his power. What? How many know the Bible, Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord's upon me. Well, I can boldly tell you today, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Not because of who I am, not because of how long I served. It's not because of the office I stand in. It's because the Bible says so.